the Iraq war was a just and necessary war. Well, I bet you didn't expect me to say that off the, off the, off the bat. I speak to you today to defend one of the most controversial American-involved conflicts as a just and a moral war. You've all heard the anti-interventionist slogans, such as President Bush exaggerated the case for war about WMDs. Bush acted preemptively in Iraq. And my personal favorite, Saddam Hussein didn't attack us on 9-11. Well, yes, and Nazi Germany didn't attack the U.S. at Pearl Harbor either. The Imperial Japanese Empire did. However, while in the aftermath of 9-11, Saddam Hussein did not attack the U.S. directly, Al-Qaeda did. Like Al-Qaeda, Saddam Hussein was an enemy of the West and of freedom and of truth and justice. And the war against this mad tyrant in our international, multi-generational war on terror was a just and righteous war, just like the Cold War, a multi-generational war against communism was just in our fight against totalitarianism and against Islamic extremism. It was necessary, inevitable, to remove Saddam Hussein from power because his rule and ideology were both evil and illegitimate. He was a dangerous pariah to the region and to his own people. And he was a national security threat who funded international terrorists, and he did have WMDs. Saddam Hussein was the legitimate leader of Iraq, and he wasn't as bad as the West has made him out to be. Wrong. Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party was never, and were never, legitimately elected. And his ideological reign was the love child of Nazism and Stalinism molded together into one. Saddam Hussein leader of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, was the Arab combination of Hitler and Stalin molded into one individual. Ba'athism, a political ideology of the Arab world, is a mixture of Arab nationalism and Marx socialism, heavily influenced by Nazism. And the first Ba'athists sought to replicate what the Nazis had done in Germany, but for the Arab people. A common saying among Ba'athists at the time was, no more monsieur, French rule, or mister, British rule. Allah in heaven, Hitler on earth. You can imagine how repugnant a party is when this is one of their slogans. Saddam Hussein was introduced to Ba'athism by his uncle, who practically raised him himself a Nazi sympathizer who participated in the failed pro-Axis coup, Arab-Iraqi coup of 1941, continually ingrained into his nephew this, the lessons of Nazism, and of, in particular, was quoted to have said this to his, his nephew, there are three whom God should not have created, Persians, Jews, and flies. This could have itself come from Mein Kampf, you can imagine. His uncle and the Ba'ath Party taught Saddam Hussein to idolize Adolf Hitler. But he wasn't the only despot that Saddam lured from or fashioned himself after. Raised on Hitler, he grew to idolize and fashion himself after Joseph Stalin. And when he came to power, developed a cult of personality and a secret police apparatus like that of Stalin. Saddam Hussein would earn the nickname Stalin on the Tigris. While the Ba'athist coup of 1941 during British rule failed, the Ba'athists would eventually see, succeed in the late 1960s after the British government had long withdrawn from the region in taking over the government. And Saddam himself eventually, like his idol Stalin, would remove anyone who stood in the way of his absolute rule and power. 
Saddam Hussein learned from Nazism, we have only one task to stand firm and carry on the racial struggle without mercy. And he learned from Stalinism, death solves all problem. No man, no problem. Okay, but Saddam Hussein wasn't a legitimate leader and he believed in some nasty ideologies, okay. He still wasn't a threat to the security of the region or to most of his people. Again, wrong. In September 1980, Saddam Hussein launched an invasion of Iran against one of his hated racial enemies, the Persians. In his eight-year-long war, which Saddam would later try to spin that he won, although the war ended in a stalemate, more than one million people died in that conflict. During that war, Saddam Hussein did something that no tyrannical regime since World War II, specifically the neo-samurai imperialist Japanese, had done, and that was to use chemical weapons as a weapon of war. Around 20,000 people died from Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war. He even boasted about losing 10,000 men alone in one battle, as if it was nothing, as if the lies of those men meant nothing and he could do it all over again. And you thought the life of a stormtrooper from Star Wars under Vader's command was bad. In August 1990, just around two years after the Iran-Iraq war, which I mentioned again caused a million plus deaths, Saddam Hussein again launched another invasion, this time against his neighbor Kuwait. Saddam, just like Hitler with the Sudetenland, and just like Stalin with Bessarabia, would bring Kuwait into his rebirth of his version of the Babylonian Empire and establish himself as the dominant Arab Muslim power. This war, which he later tried to spin as a victory for Iraq due to the coalition not finishing him off and removing him from power, he lost decisively. His forces were in full retreat out of Kuwait in less than 90 hours of land war. But did this stop his tyrannical reign? No. Saddam Hussein mercilessly and brutally put down several results in revolts in Iraq in which the people tried to free themselves from his despotic rule, just like Hitler had put down the Warsaw Uprising and Stalin had put down the August Uprising. But this wasn't his only act of crimes against his own people. The Kurdish people, a people indigenous to the mountains of northern Iraq, northwestern Iran, and southeastern Turkey. Of Iraq took advantage of the Iran-Iraq War and in 1986 to 1988 launched a campaign of independence slash secession from Iraq. In Hitlerian and Stalinist style, Saddam Hussein showed no mercy. Saddam did something that no tyrannical regime since World War II specifically Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan, had done, and that was to use chemical weapons on their own civilian population. In one chemical attack alone, over 5,000 Kurdish civilians were murdered. Thousands of villages, just like Hitler's Holocaust and Stalin's Holodomor, were wiped from the face of the earth as over 50,000 people were systematically murdered and slaughtered. And for the survivors of, his, of this terror, they will corral together in victory cities. Saddam Hussein's version of Hitler's concentration camps and Stalin's gulags. Fine, Saddam was a regional problem. He still wasn't a national security threat, and he never had WMDs wrong again. Saddam Hussein supported international terrorists, tried to assassinate a former U.S. president, and just before the second Iraq war, the first being the Gulf War, he smuggled his remaining chemical weapons to his fellow Baathists, the Syrian despot Bashar al-Assad. 
as mentioned earlier, after the first Iraq war, or the Gulf War as it is called, Saddam Hussein was bruised, but he was not finished. And he was able to successfully put down several revolts with merciless brutality. However, unable to launch a direct offensive war after two costly wars, the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf War, Saddam now switched to fighting an indirect campaign against the West by supporting international Islamist terrorist groups. Once a secular regime, Saddam now turned in the 90s towards Islamism to revitalize his regime's fighting strength and his international reach. And the groups that he supported included the Fatah Revolutionary Council, the Palestinian Liberation Front, or the PLO, the Renewal and Jihad Organization, the Islamic Ulama Group, the Afghani Islamic Party, Hamas, and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. The connection to Egyptian Islamic Jihad is very telling because Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, who founded the organization, was the co-leader and is now the current leader of al-Qaeda. While Iraqi Baathists are pan, were, were pan-Arab national socialists and al-Qaeda were pan-Muslim Islamists with opposing but both evil visions for the world, this didn't stop them from working together for mutual aims. If Stalin and Hitler once agreed to carve up Poland and Eastern Europe between each other for mutual games, why not Saddam and Zawahiri in fighting America? When the former U.S. President George Bush Sr., who had led the coalition to oust Saddam from Kuwait after Saddam had refused to leave, Saddam planned to have him assassinated when he visited Kuwait. But this plot was foiled, thankfully, in the spring of 1993. Ponder on that for a moment, if you will. Saddam Hussein tried to assassinate a former head of state, and not just any former head of state, but a former U.S. president. If even a former U.S. president is not safe from the reach of, of Saddam Hussein when he was alive, can you imagine was anyone in the world safe? Let that sink in for a moment. So, what then happened to the WMDs, though, that weren't found? They were, they were smuggled to Syria with the assistance of the Kremlin. Syria, ruled currently by the despot Bashar al-Assad, a Syrian Baathist, admitted in 2012 that it had a chemical weapon stockpile, and it has used that stockpile against its own civilians in the Syrian civil war. But where did this stockpile come from? that Assad had turned on using his own people. And I would like to add that we once said never again. And yet for some reason, we allow Arab Baathist dictators to do it again. Well, where did the stockpile come from? Former Iraqi generals have gone on record stating that Saddam feeling that an invasion of America might come and might be imminent, ordered his Republican Guard to begin transferring his WMDs to Syria, all supervised by the Kremlin's GRU, heirs to the Soviet KGB. This is amazing, you think. This is incredible. But why, ha why wasn't it reported? Answer, it was just politics. If it was acknowledged, or at least suggested, that Saddam Hussein had moved his WMDs in t just before the American intervention in 2003, then the political po opponents of Saddam, uh, uh, sorry, the political opponents of President George Bush and by extension Prime Minister Tony Blair would look like fools 
and George Bush would and Prime and Tony Blair would be vindicated. And so this truth was intentionally hidden and ignored for nothing more than politics. I will close here. Of the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein, Christopher Hitchens said, the Iraqi Ba'ath Socialist Party was modeled in large part on admiration for European national socialist movements, hoped to emulate them, especially in their nationalism against the West. But mutated by Saddam Hussein, it became also one that very, very much admired and grew a special mustache in admiration of the work of Yosef Vicenarojev Drugskavili, the great Georgian known to us historically as Stalin. So you had in him, sorry, you had him in modern Iraq, a regime in our own time that was openly directly modeled upon the two most extreme examples of European totalitarianism. Ask yourselves this. Knowing everything you know now about Saddam Hussein, the ideological lo love child of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, an illegitimate ruler who was a warmongering, ethnic cleansing, WMD using, homicidal, genocidal bully, can you honestly say that the second Iraq war wasn't both a justified and moral fight to remove him from power? The fight to remove Saddam Hussein was a costly affair. Over 180,000 Iraqis were murdered by Ba'athist insurgents, Al-Qaeda and ISIL terrorists, and Iranian-funded Shia death squads. However, visualize this. If a tyrant whose party is modeled itself after Nazism, if this tyrant styles himself after Stalin, if this tyrant goes to war against his neighbors for the purpose of reestablishing a long-gone empire under his image, if this tyrant commits ethnic cleansing and genocide against those who don't belong to his ethnic group, if this tyrant uses WMDs in violation of international law, and if this tyrant is responsible for at least 2 million people dead, if this tyrant had remained in power, how do you think the Middle East would look like today? I think you can imagine the world would be far worse off if Saddam Hussein had stayed in power. So I urge you to wake up to the truth and reject the wool that has been laid over your eyes by isolationists and fifth columns. I urge you to recognize that the Iraq war was both a necessary and a just war on both tyranny and terror. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here to hear uh, this talk on uh, Saddam Hussein, the Iran, the Iraq War, and it, the necessary fight to oust him from power. I certainly hope that you'll look at uh, my content. I examine it. I have my link tree, which I have just posted. I hope you'll follow me on Twitter, uh, on Gab. I hope you'll support me on Ko-Fi. I hope that you'll watch me on other areas like YouTube and DLive. It is extremely important to in this age and era that we stand up for the truth and that we start speaking the truth and that we do not anymore acquiesce to the lies of the regressive left and the paleo con jobs. The regressive progressives have long, far too long, been able to use their propaganda to suppress the truth. And this has to stop. And we have to fight back. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. You have a great day. Neocon action and V for victory.